Hi, I'm Dahlia Lithwick, legal correspondent, author, and host of Slate's Amicus Podcast, a show about the rule of law, the law, and the Supreme Court justices who interpret it for the rest of us. I've been watching the high court for over two decades, and I bring all that experience and knowledge to examining the U.S. justice system and democracy. Each episode, I am joined by guests with deep knowledge of the law and policy who help me and you navigate our constitutional landscape. Slate's Amicus Podcast. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Hello and welcome to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. This week, our guests are Russian expert Michael Kaufman and Republican presidential candidate Chris Christie. Remember, we love taking your questions, so write into politicswarroom at gmail.com or send a tweet to at Politicon for next week's show. Now, we're going to get to as many as we can, but don't forget to tell us where you're from. And please check out the link to our sponsor, Real Paper, in our episode show notes. We thank you for supporting our sponsors because it helps make this podcast happen. Please tell your friends about us and remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. Hey, James, the Supreme Court finally wraps up with a, with some decisions with huge political implications. Ended most uh, affirmative action in higher education, declared Biden's student loan relief unconstitutional, and said it was okay to said it was okay to uh, refuse service to uh, uh, a gay customer. Uh, it was also a session in which the ethics of some justices, especially Alito and Thomas were well beyond uh, any acceptable standard. So it's no surprise the high court is held in its lowest esteem in memory. And, of course, always in the background is the Dobbs abortion decision of a year ago. James, talk about these cases and the policy and political implications. All right. So so before on the ethics stuff, I think the John Roberts stuff is as bad is, is any of the other stuff. I mean, it's $10 million why it made working buying law firms. It's on the board of a fanatically pro-life place. But, you know, you, you can imagine if some, you know, Justice Brown's, whatever, okay, that that's enough. And Gorsuch's sale of that house and not reporting it is pretty goddamn bad. And you're right, the, uh, you know, Clarence Thomas is, is always, you know, good fodder, but there's some equally, in my in my personal view, equally as dicey as he is. All right, so let's move on to the Supreme Court. All right, this is this was what we know. People, in, in, I, I understand, given the circumstance of my life, I think affirmative action was, continues to be, and should be a, a integral tool in the policy box. I, I, I completely think it makes sense. However, the public is not with me on that. And it doesn't really, you're not going to really, in a broad-based thing, do a lot of good by that. The second is the student loan stuff. People are ambivalent about it. The more you dig into it, that, you know, if you, my first reaction was, ah, I don't like this, you signed a contract. When you find out more about it, you go, well, maybe they got a point. The point is, you're much better targeting if you can get the list of the people who were going to get student loan relief that didn't. Send them digital stuff, send them emails, send them mail, send them whatever, target them. Affirmative action is obviously more popular with, with, with blacks than it is with other constituencies. They target that, but that's not your leading target point. The, the, even that the gay cake maker, of which people say, well, there was no such guy. It, well, it doesn't matter. They were so anxious to take it. I mean, it, the Brown and Brown v. Board existed, all right? Homer Plessy was a real person. It's like a marker to him. It was a real train he took. This is totally made-up bullshit case. They were so anxious to case, take. There was no guy that requested the baker to do the website. But yet we're told that, oh, you're just trying to be nitpicking here, James. Even the press is like, that's not that big a deal. I I think it is a big deal. When the freaking Supreme Court takes a falsely filed lawsuit, I don't know how it's not a big deal. But where you want to talk, there's three words you want to use, extremism, Dobbs, and guns. All right, that's where you win. You don't win on affirmative action. 
You don't win on student loans. You don't win on bakers and websites for weddings. Now, to me, the interesting thing about the the the, the baker case is the the gay, you know, whatever. That's the if you open a business, and that's been the law in this country. You you're Bob Gay. You you have a license from the government. You got a, the government street. You got interstate commerce. You can only discriminate on the basis of behavior, which should be the truth. So now you say, well, you don't have to serve a gay couple. Who's to say you don't have to serve old people? Who's to say you don't have to serve immigrants? I mean, once you start restricting these rights, you know, you, you, in, the country is really about expanding rights, and you would have thought it was settled law that when you open a business, it, it coming with that, you, you can certainly exclude someone for behavior if they're, they're drunk or they're causing trouble or they're rude. Or don't they, pay their should, bills. Or don't pay their bills. Have them arrested. They should right. be. But but that to me, behavior would be the only acceptable. I didn't even agree with the people not serving Sarah Huckabee Sanders in, in I guess it was Lexington, Virginia. It was stupid. I, it, it was stupid. I mean, I understand, but you, you don't, the only reason to not be in any kind of public accommodation, not be allowed in there, to, in my mind, is behavior. But, but you know, maybe I have a different old-fashioned take on things. But I, I don't think these, I think these are intra-party discussions, not inter-party discussions. Anytime you're not talking about Dobbs, anytime you're not talking about uh, wife beaters being able to buy guns because that's what this case is. All right, that's or anytime you talk about extremism, or ethics, and extremism, any of that, you're on totally favorable ground. And sometimes in politics is about what you choose to talk about, and you shouldn't choose. I, I, I'm sure you can have very passionate feelings about it. I have pretty passionate feelings in favor of affirmative action, but I am not going to bring that up when I'm discussing it because it's not really a winning issue. Neither is student loans. It's just not. And it, it, but it helps with a certain constituency. And so I, I, even the, it's, it's not altogether clear that denying the, this whole fake bullshit Supreme Court no the other party in the suit, but you know, a lot of people will say, "Well, you know, if you're, if you're uncomfortable, maybe you should have to do it." It's about liberty, but the, take the take your winners and cash your checks and go home. And I really, really, really mean that. James, I uh, agree with you. I remember when I was in college, the first major civil rights bill was passed was not the Voting Rights Act. That was the second. The first was the Public Accommodations Bill right. in 1964. And what that said is, if in interstate commerce, uh, you cannot discriminate against someone on the basis of race. And I don't know why that's any different uh, in, that, in, in, in discriminating against that fictitious person, who, as you say, doesn't exist. Right. It just bothers me, and you me know, too. and everybody's in a state. You know, if you have Heinz tomato ketchup, you're in interstate commerce. Right. If you have, yeah, you of course know, you I don't do. know. Right. If you have toilet yeah. Dells or something, Kirkland Every toilet paper, right. you're Every in interstate business commerce. Is. All right. But, but, but it just, at, at some level, what really bothers me about this is, is you're giving, you know, a public business some leeway to discriminate. Now, I, I'm sure given how people are, they're going to think of other things. It's not, I, I think somebody that's not a Christian, I think the Catholic Church is the one true church and every other church is deficient or is a heretic. By, by the way, Pope Benedict had that view. I was taught that in Catholic school. It's taught in Catholic doctrine. So can an Italian deli say, I, I don't agree with Al Hunt and fucking wheezy ass Episcopalian? No, you can't do that. That's hmm. just not, it, it's not going down that road. And that's what they're leaving the door open for, I promise you. 
No, I think you're right, James. Um, I want to I want to weigh in on on abortion and the politics of abortion and the challenges, and even a little bit of a warning flag uh, for Democrats on what should be uh, a winning issue. You know, both sides have what they think is the is, is perfect for the anti-abortionists. It's abortion's murder, so there shouldn't be any on the pro-choice really pro-choice advocates, it's a constitutional right, shouldn't be any restrictions. The public is closer to the pro-choice side, but not all the way there. And I, as I look at this the last couple of weeks, some of the smart right-wingers are framing the issue not as an abortion ban, but as a ban after 15 weeks. That may not be principled, after all, if it's murder, uh, you know, the first 15 weeks they're allowing, but it gets them more in the game. Now, the pro-choice side, I think, should, emb- should simply embrace Roe and guarantee abortions up to the point of viability. That's about 23 weeks. 99% of abortions occur in those first 23 weeks. It doesn't affect the pill, uh, the contraceptive pill at all. Uh, and of the other 1%, you can make exceptions for the life of the mother. But when a few absolutists, and there are not very many of them, but some of them in politics and some of those advocates insist that no, no restrictions at all will allow abortion up to 38 weeks. All that does is let the other side get in. So just knock that off. You you know what I'm going to say? That the number of abortion absolutists in in Democrats is infinitesimal compared to the anti-abortion absolutists on the other side. It's It's correct. It's correct to say that there are absolutes on both sides, but it, 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 I'm, totally. I'm just kind of big on this. Once you get into that, and, and what you say is at some level undeniably true, but what this, to me the smartest thing you said is just go back to Roe or you go back to Casey, all right? Right, right. And, and they both acknowledged that there were distinctions. I, I know I feel differently about an eight month abortion and I do an eight week abortion. I just yeah, do. I'm and it's sorry. just, I mean, you don't let the absolute perfect from that vantage point be the enemy of the very, very good. I mean, that's. But, but we have I, 3% perfectionists, they have 30%. That's, I agree with that. The second point okay. I'd make is I hear some of these. Uh, people say, why doesn't Biden do more? And let's let's get Biden doing more and bring out Kamala Harris, be more uh, be more out front on this. Why in the hell do you want two politicians with reasonably low popularity campaigning for an issue that has relatively high popularity? But more importantly, the when the, the big abortion wins in 2022 were not because of national candidates going out there and campaigning in Kansas and Michigan and elsewhere. It's local people. It's 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 activists in those states. And that's what you need in Ohio and in North Carolina and in other states this year. I mean, yeah, Joe Biden ought to take a position on it. Kamala can give speeches, but I don't think that's terribly important. You know, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I, I hear this from a, a lot of people that you and I know and we love and respect. But, but, but just think about this. Biden's, I don't know, 41 percent, 42, pick, pick, a, pick a poll, Harris is 33, 34. Why do you want them to be the front people? Right. I agree. I, I mean, it doesn't, I understand people like, but it, it, it politically, it makes utterly no sense. None. It makes sense. James, before we turn to, you know, you potentially grilling me on something I wrote, uh, I want to just make one more point about the Supreme Court and ethics. And the Augusta Chronicle in Georgia today has a very good piece. There is an Isn't effort. Where your wife is from Augusta? Didn't she grow up there? She, well, she grew up in Augusta. So, you know, I, 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 I get credit to Tulsa where she was born. Now we'll give credit to Augusta. They got a good piece. There is an effort in the Georgia legislature to put up a statue of Clarence Thomas. Now, that's perfectly fine. If they want to put up a statue of a native son, I don't have any problem with that. However, however, it's not coming from public funds, they say. It's coming from private funds. Who's it coming from? They won't tell us. We have no idea. So therefore, I want to know who's funding this proposed statute, and do they have any cases before the Supreme Court? Given Thomas's background, I think that's a very legitimate question to ask. Oh, gee, let's see. Um, let me think. Uh, <laughs> Leonard Leo Hall and Crow. No, nah, shit. No. Uh, John Roberts. Oh, we're going to investigate this leak. 
but we're not going to talk to, you know, Samuel Alito. Well, okay, fine. And OJ, you know, we're going to find a real killer. I, I, I mean, I, I, of all of the troubling things in the world, I, I, I guess this is, I, I mean, Clarence Thomas had bought and sold so many times. It's, it's Just one more. It's like a, <laughs> you know, like a share of stock, okay? So, I, I mean, yeah, it's, oh, gee, I wonder who did this. Let, 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 let's consider this for a second. I still uh, want to give a plug to the Augusta Chronicle today, so go uh, go read that. James, yeah. James, I'm, I've been a little nervous. You told me you were going to grill me on a column I wrote, and yeah, so I, right. I've, I've, I've I, been trying I, to brace I, myself. <laughs> I, I'm actually not so much going to grill you because, I, I, you know, we're friends. We did a show together. I, I read all of your columns, and I, th- I find all of them to be quite good. I, I thought this one – was, was exceptional and, and perceptive because what's the first presidential campaign you covered? Well, really, it was it was really 1972. Though I, as a kid reporter in Boston, I would sneak up to New Hampshire in 1968. I was such so a, just, let's just a call it junkie. 1970. Let's just yeah. rough, it, it, round it, it, it off at 53. So, 50. so tell us what some of your your observations about press coverage are pitfalls, things that you know now that you probably didn't think about even five, six years ago. Well, well I think the last point. two the last two elections, James, have really posed problems. I don't think the press by and large acquitted itself terribly well, particularly in sixteen. You don't I mean, Donald Trump was able to dominate and manipulate the press like no politician since probably Joe McCarthy. You have to cover Donald Trump, but not on his terms. And that's what happened in 16. He would give a rally and the TV cameras would be there because it, it attracted audiences. Didn't say anything. All he did was demagogue, repeated himself. But he got more. It really should have been an in-kind contribution. And and Tom Patterson, who's a really good press uh, politics scholar up at, uh, up at Harvard, uh, did some research and found that CNN, this, this is a stunning figure, in 2016 used the term crooked Hillary or lock her up over 3,000 times. Now, I'm sorry. I don't, if, if Trump's going to give a speech this time on the stolen election, don't cover it. If he wants to talk about what he's going to do about Ukraine, cover it. Uh, and the same with the other candidates. And, I, you know, look, uh, people, we always complain about the horse race, and I was certainly as guilty as others, and, you know, we obviously are going to cover it. But don't just limit it to the horse race. I mean, I, I want to find out what some of these other people are doing Besides Trump, what's Tim Scott's record if he's a serious candidate? Uh, what's the difference between DeSantis and Trump if there is any? And 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 finally, we can go on a lot of this because I think you've thought about it also. You know, we, we, both sidesisms drive me crazy. Every issue does not have both sides. There are not two sides to January 6th. There are not two sides to a stolen election. It didn't happen. Those are the extreme examples. But too often, I think the press gets caught in that. And I will tell you, I am talking in the main about what I consider the mainstream establishment press, if you will, uh, because the, you know, the, the ideological press isn't affected by this. But they still play a role in, in helping frame an agenda. Well, what what happens is the ideological press uses the mainstream press, and you know where I'm going to go with this. But I, I yeah. got to, in 2016, one of the biggest culprits in New York Times. Mm-hmm. They obsess to to the point of ridiculousness on the email story, and a, a reporter by the name of Eric Lickbow, who I'm told was a good reporter, a good guy, wrote a story saying that the, the Russians were not involved in helping Trump right before the election was over. I, I'm sorry. If, if you think that those two things just stayed within the realm of the Times readership, I know you don't. And one of the things I would add to what you say is more mainstream offerings have to be careful because what they say is highly cherry picked. And I cannot tell you how much of the right wing echo chamber starts what well, even the New York Times said. Absolutely. Even CNN said, even this said, and you, you, you're right. The, the the words to the, your specific audience are somewhat meaningful, but everything gets picked up, and you know there's nothing that Democrats like better. Even the Fox News poll. Actually, I'm not sure the Fox News poll is all that rigged. I don't think it's one of the worst polls. I'll be honest with you, but I. I 
I, I wouldn't trust anything they do. But some side, even Fox News is troubled by this. I mean, that, that's a big, big part of trying to get some kind of cred in American politics. And people have to understand it's just not their readers or, or viewers or listeners that are going to pay attention to what they say, but that their words can be extrapolated, exaggerated, manipulated, anything you want. And it's very important to remember that. It, it sure is. I had the right-wing provocateur, uh, Grover Norquist, talk to my pen class one time. He said, let me tell you something. Let me tell you the difference between the kind of media he's engaged in and, and my people. We don't care about the other side. We have an agenda, and God damn it, we're going to push that agenda. And we're not going to worry about both sides. We're not going to worry about equal treatment. And what happens is when we push that agenda, they at some point say, God, it's taken on a certain critical mass, so we have to cover it. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, I think that in large part, you know, explains some of the Hillary Clinton email coverage. The Times was a culprit there, James. But, uh, you know, I hope we've learned that lesson. You you know this. They call you. All right. You've run big news bureau, some of the biggest. All right. They call you and they say and they tell your reporters and your reporters come back and say, man, I'm. We got some shit. We're not paying enough attention to this story, and they point out this. All of that shit has an effect. I mean, the, the reason that people do it, you know, the reason that John Wooden was, you know, a legend in uh, Sushesky, they worked the refs. Right. You know, I mean, right. Ted Williams, he worked, he worked the fucking umpires. You know, uh, son wants to strike, Mr. Williams will swing at it. Well, the right. difference—the difference was that 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 uh, uh, they also delivered. Uh, they had, and they usually right, right, they right, often right. were right. I mean, somebody I told me my friend Dick Flavin, uh, you know, was very close to Williams. He said he said some of Williams's teammates said whenever he argued with the ump, he was usually right because he had the best eyesight in the history of baseball. But no, I, your point. I, I, is, your point is well taken. Uh, they admitted Ted Williams in this business, but anyway, I just that's all I'm for sure. Is, you you you, you got to be careful, and and they are very fucking good at it. And the other thing is access. Look, Al, if I don't write this story, this guy's going to cut me off. Somebody, all yeah, right, and it. I'll get. I, 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 and you can see that in the time Supreme Court coverage, they went out of their fucking way. It, 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 to say uh, Adam Lip Tick, something like that, you know, oh, this was a, that guy, I, I'm not saying what he wrote in the story was essentially wrong. I think his take was full of shit. But he, he had to do that because he has, he, he's got sources in there. He's got law clerks. He might talk to the justices every now and then. And let me tell you, John Roberts is pretty good. I don't, maybe I got the name wrong. If I did, I apologize. But John Roberts is quite pleased with the New York Times wrap up of the current session, and they are going to get access. And as you know, and I know, and we all know, access is a good part of the oxygen supply of journalism, and you got to be careful. Just make that well, point. Well, there is, and also, you know, I can't tell you a number of times I heard, all right, if you don't do this story, somebody else is. Huh? Right. Yeah, yes. they're going to beat you to it. Well, God you damn it, if it's a bad it. story, let them do it. I understand, but it's, 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 it's human beings. It's not a perfectional, it's not perfectionism, it's human beings. And, you know, it's just nobody in the world that's not, you know, persuaded by onslaught, and that's what happens in politics, and it's kind of always happened that way. You know, not to say that, but it's just something to be on guard about, and they know how to do it. What, what, what Grover Norquist told your class is right. And just at some point, you got to cover it because walk in, well, this is a story, right? James, I, I don't know enough about this story to be definitive at all, but I, I see, I, I, I really see some of this in in the the current coverage of the Hunter Biden aftermath. Uh, I mean, I, you know, when I see people like Jordan suggest, I know Merrick Garland. I know he is incapable of lying. He may make bad decisions. He may be too liberal. He may not be tough enough, but, but he ain't a liar. We know that. I don't know the U.S. attorney in Delaware. No, no, I, nothing about him other than he was appointed by Trump. 
uh, it seems to me the letter he wrote to the House says that uh, that he was not limited. And there was an IRS whistleblower who I think probably is acting in good faith. But he said, well, he's an IRS guy. He doesn't understand legal jurisdictions and some of those issues. So I don't know, but I think I think that the mainstream press has picked up and given this story perhaps more credence than it deserves. Uh, the Times said they had another source that said his guy, I think his name was Shipley or something. Yeah, he was the I mean, IRS that, guy. That, that, yeah, and they said, they said the Times, I'm told, said there was another source beside him. I agree with you. I, I, I think I think they got to call people. Yeah, and I know what they're going to say. Garland's going to say I can't discuss this because it's an ongoing investigation. David Weiss is going to say the same thing. We we said this investigation continues. There's got to be, but but there's a, a there's twenty percent doubt here. I got to tell you, it, yeah. not, you know, it, what happened is I'm sure that the way it works is the U.S. attorney made a deal with uh, Abby Lowell, who have a very good lawyer, whatever lawyer that Hunter has. And, and part of the stuff is we're going to plead to this and, and we're, the other stuff is bygones be bygones. That happens a thousand times a day in the criminal justice system. And that may be what's at the root of this. It may and, be, and there there is a question as to why a tax, a, a rather simple tax and gun case took five years. Uh, and right. the explanation could be that he did look at a lot of other things and decided there weren't – weren't, weren't I, I, I think it's very, very likely. It's one thing to, to see something on Sean Hattie or Mark Levin. It's another thing to prove it in court, all right? Yeah, and, and but 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 I think it's reached going to reach. It's, I think it has reached a point. It clearly will, and let's see. We, as we call him Jim, that's G Y M Jordan. He should never be referred to as J I M Jordan. Jim is in showers. Yeah, yes, that, that, that Jim. Is Jim in, I understand. Yeah, that Jim. Uh, but it, it, the one thing I do, I do know this. I'm not suspect this. James Comer and, and J.Y. G.Y. M. Jordan are not that smart. Let me tell you who's smart. Dan Goldman, that that, that lady from the Virgin Isles, the Plaskett or whatever her name well, is. She is smart. Shit, that's that fuck. That woman is whip ass smart. I, I, you know, uh, Jamie Raskin, uh, Adam. Schiff, they, they're smart and they're scared of them. They and you hear that even on right wing media. Is the Democrats? Our guys are just not that smart. I mean, James Comer is is is. I want to tell you, he's a very stupid man. But no one ever looked at that guy and said, "Hey, that's a, that's a sharp guy." Not at all. <laughs> not at all. Well, anyway, I uh, uh, you know I I think there's a, I hope uh, that overall. The press does a better job this year than they did, certainly in 16. And, uh, y- you know, you the, the press should determine what's news. If, look, if I, I mean, Jim, I, you know, I'll go back, James, what I said before. I had no problems with CNN doing a town hall with Donald Trump. He was a leading presidential candidate. My problem was they allowed it to turn into a pep rally by picking only Trump people in the audience. And uh, so cover him by all means, cover him. But God damn it, so, if he goes out and gives another speech about, and the whole speech is about the election was stolen and January 6th was really overblown, you don't cover that. There's nothing there. Well, I, I think you ought to keep writing about this because it's something that my experience would. And, you know, at some level, some young reporters, so was our hundred guys been right. Just like maybe when you were starting, I don't know, Walter Lippman said something. James you know, Reston. Somebody, James, James, James Reston and Alan okay. Otten were my idols. All right. Well, okay. If they if they said something, you would pay attention to it. Right, right. All right? right. And, and you know, when you get older, you think, well, gee, no one pays attention to me anymore. That's just not true. But, and, you know, so some editors and some people will say, well, you know, Bal Hunt said this. Maybe we ought to think about that. And that's how you but, – but people are going to take your views on journalism in, into consideration more than anything else because that's professionally what you've been. And like I said, I thought the column was, was quite good. I urge all of us on uh, uh, the messenger, I think, is, is, is it good, runs it's in a the good messenger. site. It's a, it's a damn right. good site. 
Uh, and I urge all our people to read Al's column and to encourage him to write more about journalism and how this is covered and what the pitfalls are. And you know, anybody can be wrong about anything, but it's worth it because and, and whatever's happened to journalism, the one thing we can say it, it, in, in the public mind, it, and I could say the same thing about politics too, which is my profession, it ain't doing very well. <laughs> That's for sure. Not good. Not That's good. for sure. All right. And, uh, okay. Was- All right, James. Hey, sometimes making the sustainable choice can feel like a sacrifice. Now, we've all dealt with with a disintegrating paper straw and maybe wondered, is this worth it? Maybe we don't actually need baby sea turtles. Now, we're kidding, of course. But that's why it's important to find, celebrate, and use the sustainable solutions that work better than the originals to help save our planet. For us, one of the best examples is real toilet paper. Using real paper doesn't feel like you're sacrificing something to help the earth. In fact, it feels like an upgrade. Real is made from 100% bamboo, a faster growing and completely regenerative alternative to deforestation, which means that we don't have to cut down any trees to make high quality toilet paper. How fast would things turn around if we had more sustainable, high quality solutions like real paper to help tackle our resource issues, James Carville. You know, it, one of the things is you should look it up because I, I did about bamboo and how prevalent in certain parts of the world is and how fast it regenerates or regrows. And, and I, I think this is a, a, a brilliant product. I, I, I envision one day maybe people growing uh, bamboo in these giant uh, greenhouses or something like that. Because, I mean, the stuff when you use regular wood, uh, regular paper, it, it takes these pine trees or whatever they use, it, it takes them a long, long time uh, to grow back. And, and by the way, it, it's a lot of carbon sinks. You, you, you really hurt the climate when you take, you cut too much lumber out. The bamboos, they, as, soon, as soon as you use them, they're coming back up. And it's really right. quick. And this, this shit can, has, you know, could expand into something bigger than we can imagine because they're, they're figuring out how to grow stuff in, in non-natural habitats. And some of it is bad, but some of it is really good. And this is something that's really good. It is, and even better, Real is also partnered with One Tree Planet. So what that means is with every box of Real that you buy, they are funding reforestation efforts across the country. So unlike the other papers that cuts down trees, Real is helping to actively plant new trees. Another thing we love is that if you prefer to shop for toilet paper in person, here's the good news. Real is available in most Target stores and on Target.com. Target carries a convenient 12-pack box, the perfect size to try out your new favorite tree-free paper. Now, if you're looking for real in a Target, it should be easy to spot. They'll be the only bamboo toilet paper and the only option that you'll find in 100% recyclable plastic-free packaging. Check the Target app today for an additional discount to save on your purchase. Make a better choice for your home by switching to real. Real is paper for the planet. You also can find the link in our show notes. James Chris Christie, two-term governor of New Jersey, former United States attorney, one-time political confidant of Donald Trump, now 2024 Republican presidential candidate and Trump critic. James, I want to warn you, he has a long history of having lefties for lunch, so we better be careful uh, today. <laughs> it's, got, it's a cafeteria line. <laughs> <laughs> Governor, uh, uh, as I wrote, uh, I believe it, uh, you are a welcome addition to this contest. You're raising important questions. You may be tougher than Trump, and you're certainly smarter. But I also wrote that you broke in late 2020, realizing that Trump's, quote, ego was more important than our democracy, end quote. Now, this is a guy who habitually lied. He trashed institutions and patriots like Jim Mattis. He actually gave you COVID, and all he cared about was that you didn't blame him for it. So I guess the question is, why did it take so long for you to find this road to Damascus? 
Well, Al, because, you know, look, uh, as, as you and James both understand from having been in this business a long time, American politics isn't always about voting for who you want to vote for. It's about voting for who's left. Um, and frankly, given the choice between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton in 16 and Donald Trump and Joe Biden in 20, um, my view was I still wanted to support Donald Trump. But that ended on election night in 2020 when, for me, he went, uh, you know, well, well over the line when he, you know, s- said on election night that he was, the election had been stolen. And it was clear to me that he could have no information that would indicate that. And that was really just his ego, not being able to live with the fact that he was the first person outside the state of Delaware to lose to Joe Biden. And so, um, you know, to me, that was undercutting our democracy, standing in the East Room of the White House behind the seal of the president. And that was the end of it for me. Okay. Um, you were a top federal prosecutor. Drawing on that, when you see special prosecutor Jack Smith, who has a proffer agreement with Rudy Giuliani, who spent eight hours before the grand jury, Mark Meadows, the former chief of staff, has testified and been very quiet since then, as well as others. Does that suggest to you, does your intuition tell you that some kind of bombshell indictment is imminent? What it tells me is that he is running a really thorough, um, complete investigation and that he's got enough information to get people who might otherwise be unwilling to cooperate to cooperate. So all those things indicate that charges are coming. Who they're coming against, you know, no one knows. And that's the thing I used to say Al, all the time about the job when I was U.S. attorney. The thing I loved about it the most was only I knew what I knew. And Jack Smith's in that position right now. Only he knows what he knows. But certainly seeing those things that you just laid out tell all of us that um, he's got some real evidence uh, that is making people like Giuliani and Meadows being willing to cooperate. And the only person higher than them is Donald J. Trump. Yeah, that certainly could be argued that he would be it. Um, and right. so, you know, although I have seen prosecutors before who also cooperate laterally as opposed to just cooperating up, so you could see some other people on the legal team um, that could be, and so from campaign, from the campaign, who might have been participating in this post-election activity um, that led to January 6th and uh, the disturbance of the peaceful transfer of power. Well, again, this is speculation, but again, you know how prosecutors operate. Now, is it more likely that Smith is going to wrap this into one package, trying to overturn an election, pressuring officials to change vote tallies, creating fake electors, inciting the January 6th violence, obstructing Congress, rather than separate out the January 6th uh, mob assault? Look, I, I think that a lot of the, the, the already the participants – in the riot on Capitol Hill on January 6th have been charged. So <clears throat> I think that you're probably going to see him try to do all of it together. Um, it would be mm-hmm. neater that way. Um, but again, some of those things may be jurisdictional out and whether or not they can charge all these different folks in the same jurisdiction would be brought in D.C., would be brought someplace else. And you also have to wonder about what's going on with Georgia as well and whether or not they don't want to overlap with things that uh, the Fulton County DA may be considering charging as well. Yeah. Trump on the surface seems oblivious, arrogant, cavalier about this. He's way up in the polls. His insults continue. He's actually planning, I think, to stiff the first Republican debate next month. By the way, are you going to be on that stage? And how do you react to Trump's reaction? Well, I plan on being there, yes. Um, And I think... You know, we'll have an announcement to make in the next week or two regarding that. So um, we'll see where that goes. And um, secondly, as to Trump, look, um, it's an act. He is worried. Um, there's no question in my mind, knowing him as long as I do, that he is very worried about the, the possibility of going to jail. Um, very upset about the idea that he was charged. And the rest of it's just an act, Al. Um, he's 77 mm-hmm. years old. And the prospect for any person at that age, when you add to it, given where he's been in his life, um, of considering being incarcerated, um, will make anybody frightened. And I think he's not immune to that. 
James? So, so Governor, there are two things I hear about your candidacy, and I'll certainly let you weigh in. One is, look, man, th- th- this guy hates Trump so much, he's just going to chase his ass around and try to land as many blows as he can and hurt as much as he can. Uh, what, what I would say is I know a lot of people in politics, everybody that goes to the trouble of running, most everybody, particularly a successful politician that goes to run for president, has some kind of way in the back of his mind that he can win this goddamn thing. And so tell our audience, so what do you say when a donor says, look, I'll, I, I'll love you, Governor, I'll give you anything, but I'm just, you know, you can't win it. You know, I know you hate Trump, and I do too, but that's, that's not enough to take all this time away from family. I have some idea of how much money this is costing you personally. Are you in this just to sting Trump, or you actually have an idea of how you can get from here to there? Well, first off, let me say I don't I don't hate Trump. <clears throat> I, I don't really hate anybody that I can think of at the moment, James. I, and so um, I have no respect for him. Um, right. But that okay. wouldn't be what would motivate me to run. You're right about that. Um, but I don't think the two things are mutually exclusive in terms of how you approach it and how you win. Um, I, I think we all got fooled in 2016 into this idea that there were lanes. There are these lanes to, to get to the nomination. And there was an establishment lane that had me and Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio and, and uh, John Kasich. And then there was the kind of more conservative lane of Trump and Carly Fiorina and, and Ben Carson and Ted Cruz. That the winners of each of those lanes would then face off against each other like this was the NCAA basketball tournament. Um, well, it don't work that way. And it didn't work. That way. I wrote a column saying that. <laughs> right. By the time we all got done beating each other up in the establishment lane, Trump had won the nomination. Uh, James, my theory on this is that there's only one lane to the nomination and Trump's at the head of it. And if you want to be uh, the nominee, you've got to beat him and you got to go right through him. And so to me, the two are not mutually exclusive. You can, in fact, um, be going after Trump and want to go after Trump, not because you don't respect him or don't like him, but because that's the only way to win. And to me, um, the person usually who kills the king becomes the king. So, um, all right, the discredited lane thing, but all right, let, 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 there's a lane. Your end of strikes me. Governor Hutchinson, who I, I know Eh, not well, but pretty well. Seems like a very nice guy is in this thing, too. And now Governor Kemp of Georgia, who I do not know, but strikes me as a, a pretty effective uh, politician. Have, are you in any kind of discussion? Have, has anybody thought, well, maybe if we just all got behind one person in, in this, quote, lane, unquote, it, it would be better. Are we just going to go to this with a lot of with company in your lane? Look, you know, some of this stuff, um, uh, you know, uh, James, is going to be um, is going to be fought out between now and let's say August 23rd. You know, who's going to get on the stage and who isn't? I think if you don't qualify for the debates, it's very hard to go forward from there. So first, we have to see who qualifies for those debates. Um, you know, as far as um, as Governor Kemp, he and I are good friends. I was a very early supporter of Brian's. Um, and, and I, I don't, Brian's not running, um, for, for president. I think, you know, this, I think quite frankly, the folks who decide they're going to get into a presidential race late, um, you know, usually don't go anywhere. Um, it's, uh, it's very, very difficult to get in at a later time. Finally, deadlines start to creep up and they will start to creep up early this fall. Uh, debates have already occurred. Lots of people who raise money have already made commitments. Um, and so I don't know what Brian is going to do or not do. Um, I have a lot of respect for him, but I find it hard to believe that people are going to get into this race much later than now and have a legitimate chance to try to win. So in February, it was up to Hey Adam or something. I ran, I ran into Governor Chris Sununu, who strikes me as a, as a very charming, affable man, obviously a pretty, very successful politician in New Hampshire. Uh, do, do you think you have, is there some chance that he might endorse you? I know you're going to be talking to him, right? I mean, the line of communication has got to be support. open. Yeah, James, look, I'd love to have Chris's support. We're, we're saying a lot of the same things. And he has said that uh, once he decided himself that he wouldn't run, that he's going to get involved in the race. He's going to make an endorsement. And he's going to try to make a difference in the race. Um, and he clearly is not a fan of President Trump's. So, uh, you know, I would hope 
um, to be able to earn Chris's support. But I, I've known him for a long time. I've known him for over a decade. And um, I think your evaluation was right. He's, a, he's an effective governor. He's a nice guy um, and someone who I, I think has some very strong feelings about the direction of our party. So love to be able to get his support. But you know how that goes. We'll see how it, how it develops over the next few months. One more question is a legal question before I turn it over to Al. I, I keep hearing this. You know, in that southern district of, of Florida, the jury pool is not good. You could get one holdout juror. You you have a lot of experience with adverse political jury pools. Now, my experience, I've talked to federal judges about this, is juries are generally pretty conscientious. Do you think it's overblown as to how difficult the jury pool is in, in, in South Florida compared to what it might be in Washington, D.C. or somewhere else? What's, what's your experience in dealing with juries and adverse jury pools? I think it's completely overblown. And I, I, James, and when I, I think when a, when a jury gets into the jury box and they get sworn in by the judge, my experience has been that uh, all the juries I've ever run up against take that responsibility incredibly seriously and really do check um, a lot of their opinions at the door. And for the ones who won't, you, if you do an effective questioning of them during jury selection, you can usually, you know, fess that out. And so, you know, I think, is it is the jury pool in the District of Columbia more liberal than the jury pool in, in Southern Florida? Sure. But I don't think that necessarily leads to the conclusion um, that someone's going to, uh, you know, act unfairly as a jury or with prejudice. And and I think that most jurors that I've ever run into uh, in the seven years I was doing this stuff, um, they take their responsibility seriously. They know that they're, they're talking about people's liberty and they're not going to do something, I don't think, in my experience, that would be unfair or unjust. Uh, thank you, Governor Al. Hey, Governor, uh, I think it's, this is, you would agree with this, you were a kind of a little bit to the right of center conservative in the Reagan and Bush mold. That party today, when you look across the spectrum, almost seems like yesterday. You look at what's happening in states from Michigan to Texas, and it looks like more of a MAGA party. Do you really see that changing anytime soon? I think people are tired, um, Al, of all of the drama, all of the self-centered nonsense that Donald Trump is giving them all the time. Um, and quite frankly, I think, you know, he's the person who's helped to create um, that sector of our party um, and and uh, give, it, give it prominence. And I think if you defeat Donald Trump, uh, it's not like that part of the party will go away, but we won't be, you know, kind of maniacally focused on just that. If you, if you look at some of the polling that I've seen nationally, you have about a little less than a third of the party that says they're going to vote for Trump no matter what. Um, you have about 25% of the party who said they'd never vote for Trump. And then you got about 40 to 45% of the party um, that says, well, I might vote for Trump, but I'm willing to be persuaded. So you're talking about 65 to 70% of the party who is willing to either be persuaded not to vote for Trump or won't vote for Trump under any circumstances. Yet all we ever talk about are those you know, 30 to 33 percent of the folks um, to me, um, where this race is going to be won or lost is not writing those people off, but focusing the majority of your attention on those who can be persuaded or those who say we're Republicans, but we'll never vote for Trump. Well, I, I, you're right. We do focus entirely too much on Trump. But part of the reason is looking look at the House Republicans, for instance. Kevin McCarthy makes a rather benign statement that he's not sure Trump is the most uh, electable candidate, and he gets spanked by Trump and he apologizes. He crawls back. And if you look at most of those investigations by Jim Jordan and James Comer, they really are aimed at, at, at a Trump vindication. Uh, I mean, they are the ones that keep uh, a lot of this going. What, what, I mean, what's your response to well, that? Look, it's, and the Jordan. It, it's a, it's a five vote majority Al, in the, in, in the house. And anybody who's the speaker with a five vote majority and one vote uh, can get you or one vote person can make a motion to uh, remove the speaker. Um, you know, the speaker tries to do everything he can to keep everybody happy. Um, that's no shock. Uh, and, and that's a position Kevin McCarthy is in. So I can't say I'm all that, um, 
concerned or moved by that. I think in the end, what Kevin said initially is what he really believes. And what he said on the second part um, was just to uh, mollify some people in a very, very difficult caucus to manage. Well, one person you do know is Christopher Ray, uh, uh, and uh, one of the—I mean, one of the efforts by the Jim Jordans is, you know, to try to get rid of him. They may not impeach him to try to force him out. Give me your take on that. Well, look, I, I've said before. I think I said it most recently uh, in a town hall I was doing. You know, I support Chris. I know him well. I worked with him in the Bush administration. I think he's one of the brightest uh, lawyers I've ever met in my life. He is um, extraordinarily patriotic um, and one of the most ethical people I've ever met. So now, if I were president, Chris would be held to the same standard everybody else is held to. He's got to do his job and he's got to do it the right way. Um, and if he does, um, then, you know, I, I, I think Chris Ray deserves to stay as FBI director. But he's no different than anybody else. Um, if you don't do your job well, you can't stay. But I, I certainly would keep Chris. Is it fair to say then you disagree with the attacks from Jim Jordan and the like? Yeah, to the extent that those attacks try to say that Chris has done something partisan or unethical, um, I, I totally disagree with that. Let me ask you one policy question, because you are running uh, for president. And one of the big issues that's going to confront the next president, if it's President Christie, is that the Trump tax cuts, which are skewed mainly to the upper income, they expire in 2025. CBO says that extending them would cost $3.5 trillion over the next decade. Now, you are a, a reasonably conservative uh, fiscally. Would you vote for to, or would you propose to extend those tax cuts? Look, I, I don't think that our problem, Al, right now is that we're not taxed enough. Um, so I wouldn't look at anything that was going to try to increase taxes. Um, I think our bigger problem is on the spending side. Spending has gone up astronomically, as you know, um, in part because of COVID. But in addition to COVID, the enormous amount of spending increased by the Biden administration. Um, and so I, I think, and, and by, quite frankly, by the Trump administration as well, outside of COVID. Um, so I think we need to do a number of things um, on the spending side and on entitlement reform before we look at any raising anybody's taxes. But you would, do I take it then you would you would have problems with not extending those expensive Trump I tax would, cuts. Al, because that would be a tax increase for people, yes. And I would have a problem with that in okay. the current context. What I think we need to focus the country on, and it hasn't been focused on this, for a very long time, really going back to the Gingrich Clinton years. We have not been focused on trying to reduce spending um, and balance the budget. Um, and we haven't done that since uh, 2000. Um, so we're nearly a quarter of a century in and we need to get back to focusing on spending. And both Republicans and Democrats have been guilty um, of increasing spending uh, without, without paying for it uh, and continuing to run up the enormous deficits we have. Well, I'm going to turn this over to James, but you have proposed, I believe, cutting Social Security benefits by raising the retirement age and means testing benefits. What I've said is that I'm not going to do it. It's going to be done automatically by 2034, Al, um, if we don't do something to reform Social Security. Um, it will be a 24 percent cut in benefits automatically in 2034 if we don't do something um, to reform the entitlement system. And so I have talked about for younger people. Um, in their 30s and 40s, um, raising retirement age as something we should consider. And yes, I do think that means testing is something that we should look at. Um, I don't think people who are extraordinarily wealthy, whether they paid into the system or not, um, are, are, should, should necessarily receive those benefits. And, and I'll, I'll tell you this, there's lots of things that we all pay in our taxes um, that we don't necessarily get a direct benefit for, but direct other members of our society who are in greater need. Uh, and so I think Social Security needs to be there for those who need it to support them. But for those who have done extraordinarily well over the course of their life in this country, um, maybe, uh, you know, means testing some of that is something that deserves to be looked at. Because otherwise, Al, we're going to be talking about enormous tax increases um, for everybody. And I don't know that that serves the country well. James Carville. So, so Governor, do you know David Weiss, the U.S. attorney in Delaware? Never met him, James. I don't. 
Um, and I, I really don't even have anybody in my orbit who has interacted okay. with him. All right. So I, I'm going to ask you the easiest question you're going to get in this whole campaign. <laughs> so you and I, we, we spent a, a lot of time together at Hobart and William Smith College at the great Mark Guerin. And we spent a lot of time in a green room talking. And I, I want you, the one thing that struck me about you is you, you're a pretty dedicated family man. T- tell, tell our listeners about your wife, your children, your parents, anything. Just to, to just tell a little bit about the Christie family because I, I think you speak of it with great passion and love. Well, my wife, Mary Pat, and I, James, uh, met 40 years ago um, at the University of Delaware. We were both fighting blue hens. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and wound up, wound up getting married a, a year and a half after we left college. At, I was 23, she was 22. Um, I was still in law school. Uh, we, we, we worked together to f- have me finish law school. And then she had a career on Wall Street, a very successful one. Um, and I went out to practice law. Uh, we have four great kids who are now between the ages of 29 and 20. Um, Andrew, uh, Sarah, Patrick, and Bridget. Um, three of them have now graduated from college, one from Princeton, one from Notre Dame, and one from Providence. And uh, we have one child left, Bridget's left at the University of Notre Dame uh, as a junior coming up this fall. So, uh, you know, I'm an extraordinarily lucky guy. Um, I spent the part of the 4th of July weekend hosting my dad, who's now 90 years old, and in great health. We hosted him down at the, the Jersey Shore, for the 4th of July weekend. And um, he's a great guy um, and somebody who I have enormous amount of respect for. And I'm Mary Pat's side. We're fortunate enough to have her mom still with us, who's 94 years old and the mother of 10 children. I married into a family of uh, 10 children, nine siblings for Mary Pat. She's the ninth of 10. So that was quite, you might, you might conclude, James, yes, correctly, they're Irish Catholic. Um, and, uh, yeah, given her name and your children's name. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I, I, I can. Yeah. Do, I'm Irish myself, but not many and, people and know so, that. And <laughs> so, you know, we we are a very fortunate family. Um, I, I, the thing that I'm the proudest of, James, is that my um, my kids like each other. They like to <laughs> hang out with each other. Um, they love to spend time with each other. And so, you know, as you get older, as you know, as you and I are getting, um, one of the things you one of the things you want the most is to know that your children after you go um, are going to be friends and uh, love each other and want to hang with each other um, and will help each other, you know, continue on the family traditions. And so I feel really lucky in that regard. Governor, thank you so much. Al, you have another question? No, I would just add to that. I I, I think if I'm if I'm not I think I'm right uh, that your wife grew up in Chester County, Pennsylvania. Sure did. Paoli, Pennsylvania. Al, the last thing on the Paoli level. I grew up right next door, so I know that's good stock there, Governor. And we also, we every summer, we spent at the New Jersey Shore. So you put those two together, and I know uh, that says a lot about the Christie family. Al, we're practically brothers, given that background, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's not going to help you in the campaign, I'm afraid, yeah, no, I know. <laughs> Another hurdle to overcome, Al. <laughs> I'm kind of famous up uh, for being quoted as saying that Pennsylvania was Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and Alabama in the middle. What I actually said, it was between Paoli and Pent Hills, because I recall Paoli is the last stop on the main line. <laughs> it is. Sure is. Pent Hills is, is the last, the easternmost transit stop in Pittsburgh. But why step on a good story when it's just easy to say? That's exactly right. Uh-huh. You don't want to mess it up. Out. You, listen, James, you've got two. You've got too well formed and a reputation at this point. We don't want to screw it up. Yeah, you know what? And you, you got me on something I didn't know. I had assumed Paoli was in Delaware, not Chester, but I know now that I'm wrong. <laughs> Chester County. Oh, it's in Chester. And I'll tell you who else lives in Paoli, Governor, is is uh, President Eisenhower's grandson, <laughs> David. You know and, what? Uh, and Nixon's daughter. I, I knew that. And, and uh, my mother-in-law has reminded me a number of times of, uh, of that. And uh, she's quite proud of it. As a good Republican. He is a revered professor at the University of Pennsylvania, where I sometimes teach. And those young lefties have no idea that uh, his father-in-law was Nixon. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, Governor, you have been terrific. Thank you you so much for your time. Thank you, sir. Thanks thanks for having me on. Always enjoy both of you. And uh, and, uh, we'll keep talking to you as we head down the trail. Anytime, Governor. You were very very gentle with us. Thank (laughs) you. Hey, 
Hey, James, Michael Kaufman, born in Kiev, is a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment and among the very best analysts of the Ukraine war. Welcome back to this podcast, Michael. Uh, let's let's start with Russia. Ten days ago, after Prigozhin attempt, Prigozhin's attempted coup or whatever it was, there was sort of a sense that Putin may not be in peril, but he was weakened. Is that still your sense or is his hold as tight as ever? Sure. Well, I think what's weakened is uh, very much the perception of the competence of the regime and people's interpretation as to how well uh, the security services, or at least how much the security services are willing to fight on behalf of. What they saw was a lot of apathy, and they saw important elements within the regime standing back to see how it would play out. So in general, I think it is weakened, but... On the other hand, I know everybody would like to have a one-handed analyst, so it's just an easier narrative. But on the <laughs> other hand, um, it also made clear that, that a substantial percentage of the military and security services wouldn't back uh, the mutiny and that apathy is not enough, that a lack of investment in the regime and its longevity is not enough. Prigozhin's problem was that he did not present a political alternative that was viable or interesting to the elites. And so it takes a lot more. And he showed that, yes, you can achieve a bunch with direct action, but just having people being unhappy with the regime or the war is not sufficient to conduct a leadership change or a regime change. Well, yeah, you know, that's interesting. One one trait of, I think, almost all dictators is they surround themselves with third raiders. They don't want any rivals. Uh, the Russian military badly miscalculating uh, in Ukraine, expecting a short war against a weak opponent, said it's been a 16-month slog. Are they showing the capacity and leadership to adapt? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you look at how the war is unfolding right now, the Russian military, like most militaries, have a big challenge learning in the war because, for one, it's very hard to take tactical lessons from a particular battle and institutionalize them across right. the front, front. For another, as a war goes on, your force quality deteriorates, right? You lose your best people, and so your actual ability to implement any adaptations gets reduced over time. But another, you actually have seen significant adaptations to how the Russian military does logistics, how it uses air power to the way they uh, conduct combat operations very large, both from a tactical perspective, from a large organizational level. I would say that the overall narrative that you've seen emerge over the last year and a half, that sort of the Russian military is kind of ossified Soviet style military and can't adapt isn't true. Um, but there are obvious issues. It's a military that has uh, centralized command and control. If you think of command as kind of the human element control, the technical element, and that reduces the ability of the military to adapt. And secondarily, from a military culture perspective, they do have a big problem, which is they do not reward initiative, right? And so in that respect, the Ukrainian military is much more adaptable, although they have their own host of issues. They too mm -hmm. are a successor Soviet military, right? They also have their own host of problems with military culture, with adaptation and what have you. On the Ukraine front, you, you said a couple of weeks ago that the uh, offensive was going more slowly than they had hoped, that, you know, there was time, but it was going more slowly. Is that still the case? And, and what do we look for in the month or months ahead? Yes. I mean, I think it's clear to most folks a month into this offensive that's not gone as well as many had hoped, and it's certainly not going as well as the Ukrainian military had hoped. And the question is, what do we make of that? First, it's, it's still pretty well within the expectations, I think, of most seasoned analysts who expected that this would be a tough slog, a, an assault with relatively fresh units against a prepared defense with a lot of fortifications, mines, what have you, uh, would be challenging under the best of circumstances. Ukraine has settled for now into an attritional approach, which is what happened before in previous offensives, like in Kherson of last year in September. And... Uh, will likely make another series of pushes. Folks like me said it was going to be very fitful. It will involve a series of slow incremental advances. And you always hope for the breaks. You hope to impose dilemmas on your opponents. And uh, you, you essentially hope to be able to take advantage of opportunities. But it's going to last months. What should folks look for? 
First, I think they should look to see if there's a major commitment of Ukrainian reserves. There's likely to be another major push along one of the three axes that they are currently working. And we might be in a much better position to judge the future course or prospects of the offensive once we see the commitment of the bulk of Ukrainian combat power, which has still been waiting on the sidelines. And, and Michael, what uh, months from now, what uh, can you define success or lack of the same? Is it taking back a certain percentage of Russian occupied territory or what would it be? Sure. I think you probably define success in three ways. I think the first would be liberation of significant amount of territory beyond what we have seen in the fighting over the course of the winter and spring. It doesn't have to be the the sort of amount of territory liberated that we saw in the fall, but a strategic objective would have to include either breaking south to the coast, right, taking back a major city that severs Russian ground lines of communication there, like let's say Mediatopol, for example, it would have to be significant. And, and the, to put it another way, what we see that would, would tell us that this has been particularly successful? Well, a 10, 15 kilometer advance towards the city of Tukmak would not quite do it. That's just the case, right? Just mm-hmm. a moving of the line a few kilometers in, in a manner that, yes, may, may achieve something operationally, but, but yields no real strategic impact, that probably wouldn't do it. And then the other two the other two criteria at least for me is that the russian military has to appear to be beaten in a very clear manner at this phase of the war rather than it appearing to be a kind of uh, a grind um where the gains are incremental and at high cost and the third is there's a proof of concept to some extent behind this offensive which is that the investment of the united states and other countries has been that with Western equipment and Western training and Western munitions, Ukraine can engage in a more efficient way of warfare that will allow them to break through Russian lines and Russian uh, Russian positions at this stage of the war, right? And, and so there's, there is to some extent a proof of the case behind the search effort to build out all these Ukrainian brigades with Western equipment and Western training. Mm-hmm. Now, this is less important, let's say, than the political objectives, But it does matter for those who are trying to think of what is the way forward in supporting Ukraine's war effort at this point. James. Uh, So, so Mike, I'm a very amateur take on things, and I I obviously don't know. But I watched the Pavosian stuff. And what struck me is he's going to Moscow, and he thinks he has some reason to believe that he has some support from what he's doing. If I had to guess, and I don't, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you're not going to hurt my feelings at all. He thought he might have some support in the Air Force because that struck me as to where he would really be vulnerable. And then he gets, I don't know, 125 miles outside of Moscow and discovers there ain't nobody going to do shit for him. And so Putin, you know, now is checking the messages, the cell phones, the everything in his establishment and figuring out who was squishy and they're, they're, it's not going to be a good outcome for them. Do you think he's like onto some kind of a purge? And do you think that Pogosian thought he could succeed and found out that he didn't have the support he did? Or is that just a fantasy, too many movies and spy novels and the Godfather shit that I read? No, that's. I, I think the first part of what you said is quite on the mark. So, Prigozhin was launching something that was more than a mutiny. He was looking to see what was the level of support he had amongst the elite and the military. He intuited something about the regime that a lot of external observers couldn't perceive, and I'd often suspected that Prigozhin's intuition would reveal what's true and what isn't. And what he intuited is that actually uh, there was a lot of space for direct action and a prospect to challenge Vladimir Putin and the regime. And he had backers. So Prigozhin is both acting in part of desperation because of the sustained fight he had with the Ministry of Defense that was essentially going to take away a lot of the control that he had over Wagner. In a sense, it was a partnership, and he and Wagner were going to be completely subordinated to them. But he's also an instrument in a bigger game. He obviously has backers in the Kremlin who have covered for him and still do. Okay, 
And there is a kind of, from my point of view, more uh, sophisticated uh, drama that's playing out here in the Byzantine palace that is the Kremlin. Uh, inch, folks clearly stood by to see what would take place. And there's a lot of suspicion that while he did not receive any active military support, and he also thought that he would have greater backing in terms of public, uh, public support for what he launched and elite backing, that early on, parts of the Russian military did not issue orders and stood by, allowing him to very easily drive to Rostov, take over the main military headquarters in Rostov, right? Uh, uh, it's essentially unimpeded. And when he sat there with Deputy Minister of Defense, Yevkorov, and uh, Deputy Head of the Military Intelligence, Sherry Alexeyev, it was a really fascinating conversation. Right? He said, uh, you know, the first and foremost, he wants to get his hands on Shoigu, the Minister of Defense, and Gerasimov, the Chief of General Staff, which is, was one of his stated objectives, right? And then Yekseyev said, Zabirayti, which means like, go ahead, take him. He sort of joked, you can have him, right? Uh, go and take him. And this was very interesting to watch on video the day of that coup, I have to say. It's, um, it communicates to you quite a bit about the sentiments within the military about their own leadership and uh, about how this war is being fought. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll conclude this. Bottom line, from my point of view, Prigozhin was proven half right, right? He... He did intuit correctly that actually he could get pretty far and he could pose a very serious challenge to Putin. And at the very least, that he could force Putin from a position of relative weakness to negotiate with him and try to get the best deal out of what he had done. Right. We're still going to see how this plays out. But for somebody who launched a mutiny that almost led to a coup, he has not done as badly as uh, some had as, as initially looked. But he also showed that he wasn't right because he didn't get the support he expected, right? That for a host of reasons, his coup ended up being a mutiny that resulted in a deal and not that much more. But it could be the beginning of something. We will see. So, so Michael, you and I have had different life experiences and you're very knowledgeable uh, analysts. About, you speak to, to generals, to admirals, to diplomats, to strategic people. And my experience is I was an enlisted guy in the Marine Corps, so I always like pay attention, maybe more than other people do. And a couple of stories really struck me. A, a couple of army rangers went over and served with the Ukrainian army, and they said, basically, this shit is a lot worse than Iraq and Afghanistan. This is a very, very tough war on the ground. And then the Times had, I thought, a, a good piece where they got an interview with a guy who was a prisoner that was, I guess, conscripted into the Russian army. And, of course, all the fuck he did was dig trenches and not very well trained. I mean, do, do you have a – I know all wars are terrible, and you, you, you can't you, – you're not supposed to give gradations of things. But when I was in the Marines, and it was during Vietnam, and some of the people had served in Korea – and these E7, E8s and E9s were saying, shit, I'd go to Vietnam five times before I'd ever go back to Korea. I mean, some wars are worse than others, but apparently this is a really grimy, shitty, hard war on the front, even by comparison to other modern wars. Is that, is that your sense of, that these guys just making it look harder than it was? No, it's a very different kind of war than the type of wars we fought in the past three decades. This war is a lot closer to the fighting you saw in World War One and in World War Two. It's a war where uh, the tactics often involve a meat grinder approach. It's a very artillery and fires heavy war. It's a war with a huge amount of urban combat. Urban combat involves the literal destruction of cities. I was in Bakhmut myself at the end of February, beginning of March, and saw what has been the longest running battle in this war. And it was an urban battle, plus a battle to enclose the flanks of Bakhmut. Uh, it's a war where um, the losses have been high on both sides. A lot of the best people have already been lost on both sides, both the Russian and the Ukrainian side of the conflict. And uh, it's it's definitely not a war that I think a lot of folks in the U.S. military have experience with. Not to be dismissive of the wars in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, what have you, right. and have a lot of colleagues that served in those wars. But right. um, 
if you've never been on a battlefield where you're actually not on the militarily superior side, there's no air support, right? There's no air cover. There's a right. huge amount of artillery. Uh, there's cluster munitions and mines everywhere. I mean, everywhere. Uh, there's a major deficit in protected mobility. Most things you're in and out of are, are not armored. And the loss rates are high. You're in a war where brigades are losing 10, 20 percent of their manpower um, potentially in, in, in a month. Right. And then getting replacements and then losing those replacements. OK, so you're you're in a kind of war where some of the uglier fights where brigades units are burning through manpower and then have to be taken off the line two, three months set. And yeah, let, let's just be honest. That's not a war that the U.S. military has a lot of experience with in the last couple of decades. It's wars we fought, but we haven't fought them in a while. And there's a lot of things I saw commentary on early on this war. For example, Russian military in, in May had tried an opposed river crossing that failed. They lost two battalion tactical groups, and uh, it, it looked like a mess. And lots of folks in U.S. military were opining about how they would do better. There's nobody alive in the U.S. military that's done a opposed river crossing, a cross river operation um, with with a uh, with mechanized or armored units. Are you kidding me? I mean, training and exercise, NATO certified exercises are not it. I'm sorry. It's not that's not what it looks like. Um, right. So this this war is a lot closer to the Korean War. Uh, if you're looking for an, a, for a fairly ugly attritional conflict that's lasted a long time that compares, it's maybe Iran-Iraq War of 1980, 1988. All analogies are imperfect, of course. And a lot of the fighting is definitely closer to World War One and World War II with very significant loss rates. Right. So, I, I mean, it, it, that, that, what was interesting, and again, this is one Russian conscript, and I wouldn't place too much value, but they don't have... One of the things in Vietnam, we lost 55,000 people, and people said, well, look, in Iraq, we lost 5,000. Shit, if we'd have had Iraq medicine available in Vietnam, we'd have probably lost 38,000. I mean, if we just got good at, at keeping people alive, the Russians don't give a shit. It, it's pretty clear. They, they, don't, they don't waste a lot of time with medics and evacuations and stuff like that. Is, is that, is that your kind of experience with the Russian military even today. It's all about mass. Just get as many fucking people as you can and plow ahead. <laughs> so two things are true. The Russian military is definitely not as equipped and not as trained and not as vested in preservation of manpower. They're much more comfortable with attrition and higher loss rates. And this war has borne that out than we would be. Um, second, you know, I'll be frank, there's a lot that goes into the much reduced U.S. loss rate in wars like Iraq and Afghanistan it has to do with both the immediate level of treatment we provide, but being able to evacuate units, people to a stabilization point in that golden hour, in that initial hour. Okay. Well, I've seen some of this myself in Ukraine, both in the fighting in Kherson in October and in the Donbass in the winter. And I will tell you that without uh, air superiority, without freedom of basing, without the ability to helivac anybody that's wounded very rapidly or get them out fairly quickly to a stabilization point, this stuff's a lot harder in a major conventional conflict to begin with, right? Even if, and, and Ukrainian forces are much better equipped from a medical standpoint, I think, than Russian ones are. But there's another side to the story. The Russian military has been substantially defraying their casualties by using an expendable force that they have employed in assaults and particularly in urban combat. Last year, from spring to the summer, they used mobilized personnel from the occupied territories of Ukraine's Luhansk, Donetsk region, in a lot of the urban fighting and probably offset, I don't know, but I would say maybe up to a third of their casualties that way. Since the winter, since December, they have heavily leaned on Wagner and Wagner's uh, ability to take in and field convicts from the Russian prison system to offset a lot of their casualties, such that a substantial percentage of Russian casualties fighting from December through April, May have been Wagner. And we know that, let's say, up to 70 percent of their forces are convicts taken out of the Russian penal system. Right? And this is significant because what it tells you is that, yes, it's getting Russians killed, but it's not getting Russians from the regular Russian military killed or Russians that are being pulled out of the economy, let's say, or Russians that, uh, that the regime cares about in terms of political consequences. 
Right? So part of the reason that you're seeing that they don't care is because they genuinely do not care. They see these as expendable assault forces. Can you – I know this is long range. This, assuming this is going to be a long slog, is it possible to even this conjecture what both sides need to reach any, any deal short of an outright victory, which probably will be elusive? All right. It's hard. We know that when major conventional wars of these types, when they go on, they go on past the year, they typically go on for several years or more. They are very hard to stop. Wars have a tremendous amount of inertia. Part of the reason for that is after you have this level of casualties and destruction, people are not willing to settle. It becomes much harder to end the war. Look at the Korean War. The decisive phase of combat can be one year and then negotiations begin and it takes two years for the negotiations to yield some kind of ceasefire or armistice, right? Yep. So you can Vietnam, start negotiating. Too. Yep, absolutely. Remember and, the table? They, they went for a year. Who sat where at the fucking table <laughs> in Paris? Like, yeah, like, look, the, the reality is that um, uh, these things are very hard to end. And... And often the decisive phase of fighting can can well be over, right? And people just keep on fighting, even though it's clear at a certain point that you cannot may not be able to substantially change the the battlefield or, or the line of control. So to me, um, we're still very much in in the phase of the war where the fighting is going to dictate the political realities. It's not clear. It's not clear what Ukraine can accomplish yet. They still have a lot of potential and opportunities, at least for the coming months. Russian military power looks to be exhausted in terms of its offensive potential after their failed campaign in the winter, but they might try to regenerate in the fall and push again in the winter. So we might get stuck with a back and forth for for uh, at least another year or more. Um, right now, I hate, I hate to be pessimistic, I'm not seeing good outlines for a ceasefire or settlement, right? Um, the reality is that the Russian leadership isn't interested in negotiating their strategies to extend the war. They think if they drag the war out, then they might be in a better position in the third or fourth year, right? The West approach, well, commendable, but has been very short-sighted and sort of putting together an offensive, then taking a wait-and-see approach to see how it turns out and then trying to figure out a bit what to do next. There's been long-term commitments to some extent, that's definitely true, but uh, I, I also wonder, you know, whether or not we're sort of hopping from one vision to another to another, hoping that something dramatic is gonna change in this war, whereas in reality, you have to think about this as a long-term conflict that's going to take years of resourcing and that may not have a satisfactory political ending or may have an ending Let's take this. There's a ceasefire. But the ceasefire can often lead to a rearmament period, and all you've done is you've bought yourself a pause, and it gets you a third war. This war is a continuation of the 2014 war. That's the reality of it, right? This is You can think of it as one big conflict, or you can think of it as the continuation war of the initial Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2014. And one of the questions you got to ask is, if you have a ceasefire and armistice now, who does it benefit more? My view is probably if it's a short ceasefire, it'll benefit Russia more. They'll definitely, it'll definitely give them more opportunities. Second, you might have just buy yourself a third war anyway. Yeah, you often get these conflicts in series. If you look at Arab-Israeli series of conflicts, India-Pakistan, Armenia-Azerbaijan, not to be a pessimist here, but if nothing is resolved in terms of the fundamental politics underlying the war, the ceasefire often buys you just a just a temporary reprieve in a rearmament period. Well, one, if I were Zelensky or Putin, one thing that I would factor in, I would look um, sixteen months from now at uh, some at the American election because if the Republicans win and it's almost fifty fifty, uh, and it's and it's, and it's Trump or DeSantis, there there's going to be a huge drop off in support for Ukraine. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So my view of it is that um, the political the political landscape very much matters. It's of tremendous significance to Ukraine. Uh, they are obviously very concerned about the U.S. election because they understand the elections in the United States matter, particularly presidential elections, even though there appears to be a relative bipartisan consensus behind support for Ukraine in Congress. Right. You still have to wait to see if the money is going to be there uh, a year and a half from now and how much there will be. 
I think the the Russian game very much is also oriented around the view that, hey, at a certain point, um, U.S. support and European support will begin to wilt, and that this summer may be the high point of Western military assistance to Ukraine. At least that's probably their gambit. And that if they play this war out for a third or fourth year, yes, they get to an election. Uh, let's say Republicans will win, and they're far more. Some parts of the party are definitely far more skeptical of the investment in uh, Ukraine's war effort. Some argue that it's taking away from U.S. Uh, investments uh, in Indo-Pacific, right, and the focus on the competition with China, and that at that point they will be in a much more advantaged position. Very valid, I think. I think probably quite a few folks in Moscow hope that if they drag this war out, the political landscape in the U.S. will also change in a way that's not favorable to, to Ukraine. I don't know if that's necessarily the case. Um, you know, my own view is that Russian, Russian hopes or expectations are often unmet, but uh, you're both much more savvy on the U.S. domestic political landscape than I am and, and how this thing is looking. Well, that's a you know to give you that uh, you know we're not going to give you that one-handed answer because it's it's uh, I think it's virtually fifty-fifty, and I think James agrees. But James, right, uh, uh, you 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 have a, another uh, question for Michael. Well, okay, my, Michael, it's more an observation. I bet on this Red Admiral Stravita song back in February, and for the life of me, we got to run a propaganda campaign. We have to tell people what's at stake here. We have to tell people stories. We got to, we've done this in every freaking war, uh, mostly that I, that I can think of. We clearly did it in the Civil War and World War I of George Creel, of the Committee on Public Information, of all of the Hollywood people in, in, in World War II. And Putin says, these sons of bitches, I'm just going to wear them down. And right now, you can sort of feel what's taking hold. It's shit, we didn't lose anything over there. And, you know, we got, you, you can feel. It just kind of ebbing away, and it's the kind of default. I mean, the only Republican we got sticking up for Ukraine is Lindsey Graham, which, Jesus Christ, I'd just be in a foxhole with him. But, I mean, I, I, I really I really wish that you guys at the, at the upper end would say, we, we need to get a real, we need to hire Edelman, I don't know, some giant PR firm in Western Europe, and and tell people what's at stake here and what, what does it mean in, because they didn't say primary Ukraine, the fuck it'd be you know what next? I mean there's a lot at stake here and I don't think people feel it or I don't think they're being told it and I think Putin understands that and, he, and there's a good chance he just guts it out. That's my view from poli- my political view of this. I think what's interesting is that generally polls show the majority of American people support the yeah. military assistance and whatnot being given to Ukraine. My, what I what I don't know, right? The public supports it, and that probably reflects itself somehow in terms of congressional support. But what worries me, and this is me just speaking as like an like typical American guy who's who's lived in this country for quite a while. I don't know if any of that matters when it comes to elections, because my own interpretation is people just don't vote based on foreign policy, and that's what I've seen. It doesn't seem to bench much. Um, I don't know if if this issue is really going to matter all that much in a presidential election, and if anyone's going to care, James, you have a much better sense of it than I do. Uh, you, you're right. You told me the least best selling cover of Time magazine was the fall of the Berlin Wall at the time. <laughs> uh, Albert, maybe you can remember that, but I was yeah. told that. But yeah, it, it, we're not. The reason is because people say, "Well, it seems like." Putin's a bad guy, and these people are good guys. And yeah, let's, we can write up a check, but it, it, it's it's in some ways it's superficial report we, support. We're not trying to do anything to build it up. And if you have some battlefield reverses, which you generally have in every war, even that kind of superficial support could could evaporate without a, a, a real effort to tell stories and to, to make heroes. And remember the Pat Tillman insane crap that even the Bush people were trying. Hmm. Uh, or the, the, what was a woman from uh, uh, Jessica from West Virginia? That, 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 that at least, But they were trying, at least trying to get some kind of bullshit propaganda stuff that was like the whole Iraq war was nothing but a fraud, but at least they were trying. I, I don't know, but I, 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 I think we're just letting this, 
you know, it's support gone its own. And yeah, it's right, you know, 61% support just for now, but it, it ain't. It's, it, I think your analysis is, is, is totally spot on. It's a kind of shallow 61 and they're going to vote on gas prices and not Ukraine. And that's, I, mm-hmm. I, I think, I think, I think, I think you know a lot more about American politics and I know more about, you know, defense policy in Ukraine, but. Thank you for being on the show. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And that's just been my own view. What folks ask me, what do you make of that support? My answer is it's great. Maybe it matters to Congress, but I don't think it's going to matter that much in the election. I just don't see don't see people in the U.S. voting nearly that much on foreign policy as an issue. No, you're right, Michael. Uh, but but I do think that if Trump or DeSantis wins, uh, there will be a sea change uh, in American support. I don't think there's any question of that. But uh, – The senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment, Michael Kaufman, uh, the very best analyst of this. Thank you so much for being with us again. We hope you'll come back. We're happy to do it. Thanks for having me back on the podcast. Appreciate it, man. We will do that. Thank you. All right, now for the outrage. I fell in love with politics at an early age with John F. Kennedy's presidential candidacy to the, to the dismay of my Republican dad. Then my political icon was Robert F. Kennedy, who if he had lived, as Mark Shields often said, would have been president and could have changed America. Ted Kennedy was the most effective senator in our lifetime. And the next generation of Kennedys and Shrivers, while full of heartbreak, continued to make important contributions to American public life. And one of the real privileges of my life was serving 17 years on the Profile and Courage Committee at the John F. Kennedy Library. That's all the background to say why it makes me so sad and angry about the disreputable presidential campaign of Robert F. Kennedy Jr., It started badly running as a vaccine skeptic, a harsh critic of Tony Fauci, falsely claiming that vaccines caused autism. It has gotten worse as he expands his his insidious conspiracies and associations. He's revived the bogus claim that the CIA was involved in the assassination of his uncle, President Kennedy. He faults America for the Ukrainian war rather than Russia, for which he has an inexplicable soft spot. He's gone soft on gun control, claiming drugs are more responsible for mass murders than sold of weapons, and that per capita Switzerland, with low crime rates, has as many guns as America. Actually, we have four and a half times more guns per capita than Switzerland. And the association he associates with the likes of Steve Bannon, Roger Stone, Mike Flynn, all of whom it's safe to say his father would have despised. He's going to get votes in the Democratic primaries, uh, particularly with people who just think Joe Biden uh, isn't up to it anymore. He has no chance to win the nomination, and nothing's going to change that family legacy, but he is besmirching it. And his campaign, I think, James, is a personal and a political tragedy. Well, I, I think that guy is, is a personal tragedy. I mean, he's had awful awful problems with addiction. His, I think, second wife, uh, her life ended very tragically. Uh, I don't know. I mean, he, he's got like a great name. He hangs out with, makes very poor choices about some of his policy positions and a lot of his friends. But what really worries me, and it, I think this is the underworld story. I mean, and, and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has got the name. He's going to get votes in some place. But the residue of him is going to be in Cornell West, who I think is very, very dangerous. Uh, Cornell West, his campaign the black manager, scholar. the black scholar, his campaign manager is Jill Stein. Now, let me say this unequivocally, was a Russian agent. I don't think she really tried to hide it. She was a uh, photograph of General Flynn and Vladimir Putin prior to 2016 election. Uh, She did a video denouncing the United States uh, from Red Square. Uh, In uh, Cornell West, I I listened to 126 
on the Sirius Urban Radio. He's on there quite frequently. Uh, it, it doesn't take a lot of votes. Remember, Jill Stein, who's never exposed for what she was, a Russian agent, got more votes in Pennsylvania than Hillary won by, got more votes in Michigan than Hillary won by, got more votes than, in Wisconsin. Than Hillary lost by. They lost by, I mean, excuse me, than Hillary yeah. lost by. Yep. And I, I think that Dr. West is is totally, you know, that Bobby Kennedy is not going to get the nomination, but could get more votes than we think just because he's, he's not Joe Biden. And it, I mean, the more I read about this New Hampshire stuff, the, the, the worse it is. Oh. And he, he's, he's going to be a lot, not so much for what he is. In the more cuckoo he is, the more attractive he becomes as a kind of protest vote. But the, the one I'm really worried about, and I don't know, you know, Trump could win this. I mean, people are on it. Ed Kilgore is on it. I've seen a, a, a Who's to say he can't win? And if you, and people are, are, are rightly obsessed in talking about the, the dangers that no labels pose. But people are insufficiently talking about the dangers that Cornell West poses. And, you know, it's a standard talking point, but to disaffected uh, voters, particularly younger blacks, you know, we own a Democratic plantation and, you know, the stuff that you hear all the time. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very afraid. I, there, there are a lot of pitfalls between here and Election Day. I, I got to tell you. And Bobby Kennedy is one. I think he's becoming very much appreciated for the pitfall he is. I think Cornell West is underappreciated. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Someone said to me today, look, the only way Trump can get off is if, you know, he gets convicted. And the only way to get off is if, you know, elected president, he pardons himself. I said, yeah, I agree. And there's almost a 50 percent chance that will all occur. That's what's frightening. And, you know, in the 40, you know, he can win with 40. He's never got over 47. Yeah. All right. Yeah. He don't, he doesn't need fifty. Right. Understand that. This, this is a this is a danger point. And uh, you know, I I think the party's gonna have to make I mean, you know what I where I really think we are, Albert. I, I think you know when I say everybody, I know I'm being overly but there is this persuasive view that I agree with. Joe Biden is, is a great guy. He's led a real life. He's a tattered, torn, still standing, you know, Washington crossing the Delaware. I don't, whatever you want to say, right? He's a, a, a decent guy who's had a, a really decent life. He has been opposed and vilified by some of, not the worst people in the United States, some of the worst people in, in all of humanity. His record from unemployment to, to even black unemployment, which is a gap is historically low to Ukraine, to y y y you name it. And he's entitled to make his case. He started to make it in Chicago. But what, what happens every year is after Labor Day, there's a spate of good polls that come out. And if these polls don't improve, the, the Panic is going to set in. I, I, I can feel it. It's like, you know, we owe it to you. you every opportunity, you've been treated unfairly. But, you know, the, the, and the sort of theory is not absurd that if you keep this thing going for long enough, people get to appreciate the inflation rate is down. If you, 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 they're going to see what they have and they're not going to want to go back to something else. I, that's a totally legitimate theory, but at some point it's got to start working. It does, James, working. and I think they have they 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 have a great uh, message to sell. He just can't sell it now. Now let me just say, when I hear people like Congressman Ronnie Jackson say that oh, he sorry. is cognitively uh, impaired, cognitively disabled, Ronnie Jackson was the White House physician. He was drunk. I mean, honest, can you imagine a physician taking care of the president? According to people who work with him, was drunk. That's why he couldn't be confirmed for a cabinet post. Uh, so that's utter nonsense. But okay. Reagan, but I'm sorry, but but uh, that was a that was a Freudian slip. But Biden's age is a legitimate concern, and a lot of people just say, "Hey, I'm sorry, Joe, you've done good, 
but it's time to, you know, it's time to go, uh, you know, check out and uh, rest on your laurels. And I'm not sure that's going to change, James. I don't know. I, I guess I do know about my years in politics. I've been wrong about a lot of things. The one thing I've consistently thought is the, the worst thing that can happen to you in politics is you confirm an existing doubt. And I right. don't know. I, I can't tell you I'd never get Ukraine and Iraq confused. But he did it twice. Right. And people are going to say, I, I, I knew that all along. This guy, what are you talking about? He's president. In, in, I, I confuse shit all the time. I'm, I'm, I'll be 79 this, in, in this fall. Uh, and it's not my point. It's in, in, he is old. I mean, it's just he is. It's not a, you can't go and say, let's pivot, let's talk to the real issues. You call these goddamn reporters and tell them to quit, call, you know, obsessing on this age shit and talk about, you know, the unemployment or whatever. They, the public it, it thinks this is an issue. And, and anything, he if, he if he says 99 things right and one thing wrong, oh, goddamn. You know, they're going to obsess on the one fucking thing. They're not going to talk about how he met with the German chancellor, the Japanese prime minister, and, you know, brought a wealth of experience and negotiating ability. And no, it don't work like that. I mean, it, it's all true. Uh, you know, it's an old stupid analogy, but it's true. 99 planes, planes land safely. Who cares? Oh, shit. One goes in the Potomac, and guess what? They're all out there covering it. Well, I if if we do reach that point right after Labor Day, as you have said, and I totally concur, there are some very attractive options out there. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid I would bet against reaching that point, but uh, who knows? Let's see. Yeah, I don't either. I, but but yeah. I, I do know this: it, it it's it's in the ether. It's not something that we're making up on this show. Right. You know, it's I'm not I'm not I'm not looking around corners and saying, gee, look how perspective that guy was. I mean, it, it is a water cooler kitchen table conversation, period. Yep. yep. End of discussion. Yep. OK. All right, now for our Screw the Voter segment, uh, James, about uh, Republicans trying to limit the franchise. La you know, last week we cited the Republican Supreme Court's efforts to curtail voting rights 10 years ago with the infamous Shelby County decision, which declared that voting discrimination was a vestige of the past. Well, our friends at the Brennan Center looked at Shelby County before and after that decision, put out a new report this week before any gap between the percentage and of white and black voters there had almost disappeared. Now, there were several factors. The popularity of Barack Obama, the first black president, certainly was one. Another was enforcement of the Voting Rights Act. If they changed their voting laws, they had to get approval from the Department of Justice. If they didn't change their voting laws, no problem. Chief Justice Roberts and his Republican majority said, decided, hey, that's no longer necessary. There's no more discrimination. Well, the gap between white and black voters ever since that decision has, has been surging. It more than doubled in the next few elections as Alabama and Shelby County, no longer accountable, passed restrictions like tough voter ID requirements that they knew would fall heavier on voters of color. This was true in some other southern states, too, that escaped accountability. Now, whether it was naive or politically intentional, the Republican majority in that infamous case shamefully set back voting rights. Uh, and uh, that's, a, that's a price I think we're paying today. Well... Don't worry, New York Times, will, for, in, in the name of access, will come up with an excuse for it. <laughs> I'm not, I, but I, I, I will say that the Brennan Senate, and it's not just because Michael Waltman's old friend, old war room guy, they ought to get the goddamn Nobel Prize, okay? I mean, what they do is so good, so accurate, so invaluable. Anybody who listens to the show should go to their site. I, 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 they're like the last... You know, that that their union army at Pickens Charge. I don't know what they are. But that, that, that is a organization that I have the utmost admiration, respect of that you can imagine. And it, and they keep churning it out, man. And it's all you can take anything they do. If they if Burlington tells you it's Easter, you can die eggs because they're right. 
It's absolutely accurate. And when, 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 when he goes over to Oslo to get that, uh, you know, I want him to take Rebecca Autry with him and, uh, Wendy, why am I forgetting her last name? That's because I'm Joe Biden's age now. Uh, the people who do great work at the Brennan Center, it is just uh, totally reliable. And they're not going to, they're not going to prostrate themselves on the altar of access. Right. I can tell right. you. Okay, now for our questions from our listeners, which are always good. And uh, if anything, actually keep getting better, James. Uh, They're current, they're perceptive, uh, and they make you think. I want to start with Jeff in Centennial, Colorado. And he said, please tell the Biden campaign that people are primarily concerned with the price of food. Start telling voters how he plans on getting prices lowered, including elimination of corporate greed. Come up with a solution to this problem, and voters will be the path to your door. When will we get back to the economy? Well, first of all, Centennial, Colorado, I was was a younger man. I read a book by James Michener called Centennial that really gave me a lot of appreciation for the kind of history of Colorado and – you know, the culture and customs have become obviously a, a, a very uh, uh, popular and cutting edge and, and, and prosperous state. So I, I, I appreciate your question. And it's a long time ago, I, I read a book and it was uh, it was pretty, in, I thought it was it was, it was highly informative. Uh, first of all, you're right about food costs. And it's something that, that People encounter every day. I, I, I just give you an example. It's not food, but it's it's fuel. Uh, Sheets is a kind of popular convenience store, gas station up and down the East Coast. I, I think it's outfits kind of out of Pennsylvania, but they're mostly in rural and suburban areas. And over Fourth of July weekend in Woodstock, Virginia, which is in Shenandoah County, uh, Deep Red, they, they had a promotion throughout there, and you could get. Gas for a dollar seventy six a gallon, and they yeah. had police out there directing traffic. I mean, think about that. And 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 I I I bet you that Woodstock, Virginia, was not a one off. Somebody had right. to read about it. Somebody had to hear about it. I was in the Jersey Mike's in Woodstock, which is the kind of place I actually like. But he's kind of sandwich change. I think it's better than most. Maybe they'll advertise for us one day. But And a VDOT worker came in and said, man, you got to go down there and look at this. It's amazing. They got two sheriff's deputies, a state troop out there directing traffic. And boy, when you, 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 you know, you see that in, in he's so correct uh, in because that's the intersection. You know, people talk about intersectionality. And let me tell you, buying food is the ultimate intersectionality in the country. And what's I think what's happening is somebody. I think egg prices are, are example. Uh, Mary and I have a farm, so we have our own eggs, so we're not affected by the price of eggs. But it, it they really shot up for apparently. Some, you know, I'm sure there's some price gouging, but legitimate reason come down. But if you pay. Two dollars two years ago for a dozen eggs, then you paid four dollars last year for a dozen eggs, and they say, "Gee, now you're paying three dollars or or any widgets or anything there is." People remember the lower price, and it, it it's hard for it to take in that you get that you get credit. But our, our friend from Centennial had that, that's a very astute question, even, even more astute and relevant than, than people live. And, and the other thing I would say to, to our friend out there in Centennial, or our whole listeners, don't talk, don't use the I word. Use cost of living because that's the way people talk about it. Absolutely. How much it costs to live. Right, right. You know? James, I normally, questions from New Orleans n- normally go to you, but I'm going to take this one, because, it, and it is a good one. Henry in New Orleans says, does New Hampshire allow easy write-in votes in the 2024 presidential primary, and who can do what to organize a citizen's campaign to write in President Biden's name on the ballot? 
Henry, let me tell you something. You have put your finger on what will be, I think, a potentially explosive situation. The Biden people decided they did not want New Hampshire to keep its first in the nation st- uh, uh, primary status, which they've had for, you know, what, 60, over 60 years. So they moved it to, I guess, third. South Carolina was going first. They said they did it for blacks. Actually, South Carolina had more power than any state in the last several presidential elections. Uh, but to answer your question, write-ins are very simple in New Hampshire. And there's a long tradition. Henry Cabot Lodge in 1964 won the Republican primary when he was, you know, 7,000 miles away, ambassador to Vietnam with a write-in. In 1968, people remember, actually, Lyndon Johnson won with a write-in, but he only beat Gene McCarthy by seven points. So it was considered a huge defeat. That's a lesson the Biden people don't want to experience. And so I, I think if someone tries a write in for Joe Biden in that primary, because they're going to hold that primary and Robert Kennedy and others are going to be entering uh, Williamson or whatever her name is, are going to be there. And I think the last thing in the world the Biden people want is a Biden write in uh, campaign because they probably won't do very well, James. And I think New Hampshire is going to be a big embarrassment for them. And they made a mistake. But it was a good article. I mean, I will be up, up front and, and admit a conflict here. I have some stock in it. I don't think it's very much, but there's an outfit called Predicted. And it, 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 and it's, it's an open market. And it's really worth looking at because it, it reflects sentiment. It doesn't set prices. It, it's like a stock. Right. And the guy that runs it is a kind of uh, Aristotle so I, I have that, but they had, they had a pretty good art, uh, article uh, about New Hampshire and the pitfalls. And, you know, the, the, the betting markets are, are a little bit skeptical. Uh, and I know it's a limited market. It's not like a, a mass market like, you know, uh, Walmart stock or something, but 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 it, it does. There's a lot of people that game that market, that that trade in and out of it. it it's kind of limited. They have some legal challenges, but it, it's really worth kind of looking at. Not time. What are they skeptical about, and, James? Yeah, I think Biden w- winning is like sixty eight cents. All right, it it it. It, it's not as the, being a nominee. I forget. I, I don't want to repeat it because I just I glanced at it this morning. Let, let, let me, but let me I, just I just Biden looked at the nomination or Biden winning yeah, New Hampshire. The, the, the winning, I, I forgot. I, I don't. I, I, I want to be accurate here. And, okay, and, okay. And I just yeah, was rummaging okay. through it this morning. But but my, my kind of takeaway was, and, and you had been on this. You know more about New Hampshire. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think New Hampshire is, is influential. As you do, but it's interesting. It's fun. I had a blast up there in '92. There have been very relevant, great stories that came out. Uh, but I, th- I think South Carolina, Georgia, these places have become enormously more influential on the Democratic side. And I think that I agree with you. And a lot of people in, in uh, Billy Shaheen, he, he ain't very happy about all this. I can tell you, he's the chairman of the party. I think the husband of a. Uh, a, a terrific United States Senate out there, Jeannie Shane. But th- this is a this is a heartburn issue. They, they opened something that didn't need to be open. And my, right. my guess is this this cookie jar is going to get slammed on their hand. But no, no. Some I, part, I, you I, have to look it up. I don't repeat what it is. But I just remember looking at it and saying, yeah. damn. I, 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 I agree. I think it was a big mistake. Uh, Nancy from across the pond in Oxford, England. Uh, oh, says, wow. What? This is good, James. What if the worst happens and number 45 uh, is reelected? That's Trump. Does he have coattails? Obama handily won two elections, but the Democrats in general didn't fare all that well. How much damage could Trump do if he has to work with the Democratic Senate and Congress? Well, first of all, no one would have, have this life experience. And I'd bring it, I've actually been twice to the Oxford Union. And the first time I went there, uh, a, a kid from Acadia Parish that's in southwest Louisiana is where Edwin Edwards is from. Uh, was a medical student there, a researcher. And I got, you know, I, you can imagine being in uh, uh, Oxford and having a, uh, a kid from Acadia Parish being there, what, what it kind of meant. But uh, at any rate, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. 
I, I just don't know. James, you do know. I want to tell you, you do know, because if Trump wins, okay. there ain't going so to be, there Trump, ain't, there ain't gonna be a Democratic so, senator. So they don't need, first of all, the Republicans don't need coattails. If everything is even, they're going to pick up a bunch of Senate seats. Right, right. All right? So that's what I'm saying. I, 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 in, in order for the Democrats to hold the Senate, they need a good election. We can't keep the Senate without a, a like, 52 and a half, 53 percent win. Yep. It's not going to happen. And, and people got to understand, it's not just the presidency that at risk here. And uh, when I see a piece, it was in the Times, uh, it, it was a Tom Etzel piece. And people are starting to say what we hear, too, that the – the Democrats could could get to could have a big win if it's not Biden, and I, I'm pretty sure it it, it was in an Etzel piece. It was kind of long. Tom Etzel has uh, a good piece but, on how the number of non-college educated whites right, right that, that the, the the demographic deck is moving our way, right? But if we don't take advantage of it, we don't need when I say no coattails. If it's a fifty-fifty, or, or if we win, if we if we have a two thousand, a repeat of twenty twenty, and, and let's assume that Cornell West and, and and no labels and everything don't quite get it over the finish line, and Biden wins, you know, eleven thousand votes in Georgia and Arizona and six thousand in Nevada and twenty thousand in Wisconsin, shit, we could lose five Senate seats. And we don't have any chance at pickups in places like Texas, Florida, Indiana, which probably are in, in order our three best chances. <laughs> You're going to win that without something big going on. So I, I, the, the, I guess the reason that I, I, I'm skeptical is a tie does not go to us. Right. A tie right. goes to them. Yep. And, you know, maybe you pick up eight house seats and you lose – Four Senate seats, and you win the presidency. Well, you kind of ain't won shit. Right. <laughs> All right? Nancy, you just, you just I, James, you're zero. absolutely right. And, Nancy, I'll say, even if he should end up with a Democratic Congress, which he won't if he wins, we're talking about Trump, the damage he can do is incalculable, starting, oh. with, pardon, starting with pardoning himself, P- pardons. then cutting off and, aid to Ukraine, appointing some seats. of the worst people oh. you've ever known in your life. So, oh. you know, it's just – it's oh. a. It's beyond oh. nightmarish. Yes, oh. yes, oh. yes. It, but we don't need we don't need a, a break even. A, a tie goes to them. Right. It don't go to us. Right. It, the country doesn't win with a with a tie. The country right. doesn't even win with a with a with a close call. I agree. The country needs a, a, a decisive democratic victory. And by the way, it's not impossible at all. John in Philadelphia says Republicans seem to have taken to accusing Democrats of being pedophiles. This is an extremely serious and unfair accusation, but I don't see Democrats fighting back. Why don't the Democrats have a full court press of messaging and legal action? John, I'm going to give you a two word answer if that issue comes up. Mallory McMurrow. That's it. Remember, Mallory McMurrow. She was the Michigan state legislator who some right winger accused her of being a groomer. And she went on the Michigan. She went on the on the floor and she just devastated that woman. She she slam dunk understates the case. She's now, by the way, the whip. uh, And she's a woman with incredible future. But if that issue ever comes up, John, I want you to go read Mallory McMurrow's speech. I think it was last year, James, when they accused her of being a groomer. So I, 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 I to maybe do some research or somebody can. If you look at, you know, substantial cases of pedophilia, uh, I bet you that there are more right-wingers involved with this than people, you know, that are easily identifiable as right-wingers, preachers, and if you that count kind the of preachers, stuff, for the sure. What about, what about Dennis Hassard? Wait a minute. The longest-serving speak, Republican Speaker of the House in history, in history, in history, the longest-serving Republican Speaker of the House in history is in the penitentiary for pedophilia. 
and of course, they don't mention his name. You know who else doesn't mention his name? Democrats in the press. You want to talk about pedophilia? Let's talk about pedophilia. All right? Let's do that. Let's have this conversation. Let's have the conversation about Bernard Law, who basically endorsed George W. Bush in 2000. Do you really want to talk about this? Let's have the conversation. Okay, John, you got lots to answer, uh, to tell people to answer if it comes up. Colin, in Mobile, Alabama, James, this is something you know. He says the Supreme Court decision in Allen v. Milligan will lead to the creation of a second uh, majority-minority district in Alabama. That was one of the few good decisions that have come out of this court. This could also lead, he suggests, to maps of states like Louisiana and South Carolina being reexamined. He wants you to confirm that, and how might this change the strategic decision making for the 2024 congressional elections. Yeah, I, first of all, I think your observation is valid. In probably there's three or four house seats there, which is not chopped liver, as it would say, in, on the East Coast. Um, you know, some of the the gerrymandering in places like North Carolina gonna, could probably hurt us. Uh, yeah, but uh, you take what you get. And, I, you know, I'm not a fan at all of the Supreme Court. I, I, I think this was, uh, you know, they did this for political cover. But you know what? We, we are going to pick up a few seats on this. Right. Pretty clear that we are. Pretty clear. Well, and that's that's good news. You can't hurt. Um, you know, and you, sure. the other thing, you're just going to make the right in places like Alabama and Louisiana. They don't even have to worry about it. They don't care about it anymore. But it, 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 yeah. it's 96 percent good news. We have a final question to you, James, and and there's two questions. They're almost identical. Richard in Sunnyvale, California, that's close enough to the Apple headquarters, and Daniel in uh, San Juan Capistrano uh, Mm. says, Republicans say we're not electing Biden president, we're voting for President Harris, given the age issue. Would the Biden ticket be enhanced with a more dynamic VP? I'm proud of Biden for choosing her in the first place, but her term has been less than inspirational. Would, given his age vulnerability, would that be offset with a different running mate? All right. Oh wow. Okay. First of all, if I were, if if the you always ask yourself, you know, you ask yourself this intellectually, if the shoe were on the other foot, what would I do? I would do this. If they had an eighty-year-old. Well, somebody was going to be 86 when they left office with the vice president, but the vice president that had a 32 percent approval. I would do this. And you can't say they're just making shit up. All right. You, you, you just can't. I, and, and, you know, it's a little bit. uh you know, they. she doesn't get a chance to flower. I think Harris's big mistake, and I, I, I don't, I might know her, not well, I know some of the people, do something unexpected, all right? I, I know it's good that you, 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 you're you on the front lines talking about abortion and, and, and you do that, but, but you're not going to get any points for that. I mean, they gave it a border and they didn't do anything, you know, be down there. Talk about... Crime stuff. It's fucking horrible and in, 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 it's bad in San Francisco. The crime is up 11% over 2022 levels, according to Yahoo, which is a pretty reputable site. In, 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 in San Francisco? Yes. It's, yeah, crime, it's not a made up problem. Right. It's crime is fucking, actually down in most big nationwide. cities. Nationwide. But, but that's not what you want to talk about. That's, that's not, not what you want, you want to talk, talk about. about. Right. No. Right. It, it, it's not down. There. She was a good prosecutor, all right? I, I don't know, but surprise me. That's all I would, that's all I would, and I know people, that, and a lot of my behalf, I talked to her when she became vice president, she was looking for a lane, and people suggested that crime would be the lane. I said, well, we can't do that. And now they're stuck with, you know, being, everybody knows you're pro-choice. I uh, think it's not, that's not going to get you anything. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's great. Mm-hmm. And, and, but you can't say 
you, you, you can't say the, Demo, the Democrats wouldn't do the same thing if they were faced with the same operative facts. You just can't. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, listen, those, those questions, they get better, I think, every week. If we didn't get to yours, please send it in again next week. We'll make sure we get to it next week. Hey, thanks for listening to Politics War Room with James Carville. I'm Al Hunt. Don't forget to send your questions for us by email to politicswarroom at gmail.com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon. Following this episode, we'd really appreciate it if you check out the link to our sponsor, Real Paper, in the show notes. We deeply thank you for supporting them because when you do, it helps make this podcast happen. Now, to keep up with us, subscribe to Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Please rate the show with a five-star review. We'll be back next week with another show as we continue our war room planning.